going to uh, bring up Chip Conley here, the co-founder of MEA and kind of the origin of these ideas of fireside chats, which is a chance to have Chip have a sort of unplugged conversation with various luminary thought leaders in the community for you. You can watch this recording later. You get to be here live. We'll be guiding this conversation for about 30 or 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions. So you can be thinking about questions that you might have. You can put the questions in the chat. You can also, at the end, when Chip lets you know, can raise your hand, and we'll bring a few of you up to chat as well. So let's just start with that, Chip. Thank you for doing these fireside chats, mm. and thank you for being here today. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Carrie. So we're going to bring up our special guest today. Um, I'm really, really thrilled. Leslie, if you can do the spotlights, I'm going to read the bios of our such esteemed and beloved guest. Susan O'Connell is here as a show. Susan O'Connell, a Zen teacher with 30 years of meditation experience, and she's lived at the San Francisco Zen Center since 1995 when she was ordained as Zen priest in 1999 and um, received her Dharma transition in 2016. She is currently the director, the spiritual director of the Zen Inspired Senior Living Project, and just delighted to have you here today to talk more about community and what it's like to live in community and what it's like to live in community in midlife and beyond. And it's our esteemed honor to also welcome Roshi Joan Halifax, a Buddhist teacher, founder and head teacher of Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We're so excited to spend more time there as we have our campus in Santa Fe opening next year. Roshi Joan is a social activist and author and in early years was an anthropologist at Columbia University and the University of Miami School of Medicine. She's a pioneer in the field of end of life care, has lectured on the subject of death and dying at many institutions around the world. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Chip, to just engage in this lovely open conversation and um, the community is really, really grateful to have you all three together. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Carrie. <clears throat> well, Susan and uh, Moshi Joan, thank you for being here with us. Uh, and for those of you in the San Francisco Zen Center community, welcome to uh, mostly the MEA community here, which is a global community um, uh, associated with the Modern Elder Academy. We're going to talk about community today. We're going to talk about uh, ritual uh, within community. We're going to talk about awe and how we experience it in our life. It's like a three-course meal. Um, but before we get started, um, let's. Just, I just would love to explore with um, with Susan and Roshi Joan about how they got introduced and discovered Zen Buddhism. Um, so maybe if you could start by just telling us what introduced you to Buddhism overall and why Zen Buddhism in particular seemed to resonate with you. And maybe talk a little bit about what Zen Buddhism is, is relative to other forms of Buddhism. Susan, please be my guest. That's a, that's a heavy menu, Chip. Um, I guess I was brought out to Green Gulch Farm, which is one of the uh, locations for San Francisco Zen Center on a weekend. So I would say beauty and nature opened up the door so that I was better able to hear the Dharma talk that day. And I don't remember what my teacher talked about. I just thought there's something here, something is happening here. So I was introduced through the kind of opening and ease that can happen from beauty. Um, that started me down a path. And another teacher introduced me to three different kinds of meditation, very early days. And I did Tibetan meditation one day and I got really high really fast from doing visualization work. And then the next week I was introduced to Zen, which is done with the eyes slightly open. And I thought my life is already too exciting. So Zen is the medicine for my life. And that was my attraction to, uh, to Zen. So mm. wonderful. <laughs> Joan. Yeah, thank you so much, Susan, that's beautiful. Beauty brought you. Um, actually, something else brought me. It wasn't beauty. It was in the mid-1960s where I was a social activist in the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. And I had the very uh, the, the good fortune 
to encounter uh, a young Vietnamese monk who came to our country to ask us to stop bombing his country. And like many people my age, um, I was riven with moral outrage toward my government and toward my society. Mm. And when I uh, encountered Thich Nhat Hanh, um, not in the proximate way that I did 20 years later, um, but you know, hearing his dharma, experiencing his presence, um, I realized that I could be a social activist and a contemplative. I also realized that um, I wanted to change my mind because I was suffering from moral outrage and that uh, I wanted to end that suffering in my life. Mm. So my realization um, led me, needless to say, to look into Buddhism. This was in the mid-60s. Became a book Buddhist for 10 years and then began practicing the teaching. What, what, what is a book Buddhist? You know, it's somebody who reads about meditation, uh, is self-taught in meditation, um, reads Dharma. You know, Alan Watts was very big uh, in that era. Uh -huh. And so, you know, kind of popular uh, perspectives um, in the, the Zen world. And, um, you know, but doesn't have a teacher, doesn't have a Sangha, and uh, doesn't have a practice that uh, is consistent. And then, you know, I realized after a decade that it was important to have a teacher, it was important to have a community, and it was important to do deep study and also study in terms of my own subjective experience. Mm. So, you know, everything uh, unfolded from there. But I do want to say, uh, along with what Susan mentioned, Chip, I found... Um, Buddhist psychology and philosophy to be very practical. Mm. I wasn't so interested in the drama um, associated with sectarian uh, approaches. Uh, I had enough of that drama in my life. Also, I was married to Stanislav Grof. And so, you know, that was a, a whole world unto itself. And um, I wanted to be grounded. I wanted to be clear. I wanted to bring um, this world of social action and social service together with uh, deep practice. Mm. So that it's been the path for over a half a century. And, and Chip, I'd like to add one thing too. Yes, please. I talked about what opened me up to the study of Buddhism and beginning to practice. But what moved me into a Buddhist community mm. was the need for taking refuge. Mm. I had had an 18 month period of time in my life that had, I had loss in about every aspect of my life and mm. in a very short compact. And I wasn't able to skip over the top of it anymore. I'm quite mm. good, I'm quite resilient and I would skip across pain and suffering. So I stopped. And I moved into the San Francisco Zen Center and that stopping allowed the grief to arise and the environment supported me to grieve. Mm. And, and so taking refuge is, a, I think, an important part of the possibility of community. Um, and I, that was in 1995 and I thought I was staying for two months. Mm. How old were you at the time? 50, which is the other thing I want to say is you want to talk about midlife shift, right? <laughs> That's a moment. Yeah. And I, human beings, you know, in my case, my son was gone and I wasn't in a relationship anymore and all kinds of things. 50. Yeah. Wow. I, you know, at some point, uh, <laughs> we're going to have you teach <laughs> an MEA workshop because, yeah. 45 to 50 is the at the, the, the bottom of the U curve of happiness. Mm -hmm. It is, it is, as Richard Rohr would say, the time when your primary operating system is shifting from your ego to your soul. Mm -hmm. There's so much richness going on during that period. So let's talk about the Sangha, um, the Buddhist word for community. And in the context of both Upaya in the Zen mm -hmm. Center. Uh, that, that Roshi, Roshi Jonah oversees and is in, teaches where she teaches um, in Santa Fe, as well as the San Francisco Zen Center 
and what San Francisco is doing with Enzo Village. Maybe let's start with that, mm -hmm. uh, Susan. Tell us a little bit about how the San Francisco Zen Center is organized and how many people live there and you know what that experience is like and then why you decided to create in essence a, a retirement community uh around buddhism uh in in uh the um sonoma wine country so as you know short stories are harder to write than novels so let me see if i can uh -oh. be concise but um the san francisco zen center has three primary locations we're quite fortunate in terms of property that came in the early days with donors helping us. So Tassajara in the Ventana Wilderness, City Center in downtown San Francisco and Green Gulch Farm in Marin. And when we're full, we have about over 200 people that live in community com combined in those three locations. Um, so that's the shape. And I think we've also graduated maybe another 400 teachers who have been trained and go back out into the world and start their own groups. And we have about 80 affiliates through the United States and, and uh, Europe, one, one in Asia. So um, we're robust as a community. And But we hadn't figured out how to honor the promise to our senior teachers of caring for them in their retirement. So we would promised it, but everyone who promised it was 40 when they promised it and thought, well, yeah, someday we'll figure it out. And then all of a sudden, everybody's 70. So um, the solution was to, to find a, a, a partner who could help us create something where maybe 20 of the Zen Center teachers, senior retiring mm -hmm. teachers, could be part of a larger community, and we could share our way of practice and of, of kind of showing up for change and various other things that we've been uh, working on together in community for a long time. So it was both practical solution to our situation and a way to continue to share how we know how to live together and how we know how to face difficulties with the aging process with the people who, who were up for that. So that's what started in Enso Village. It's a huge project. I mean, it's this is not just a small little thing, and you're, and you are. It's a nonprofit that is in partnership with one of the best known retirement community developers in in the U.S. So, talk about the size and scope of it, and mm -hmm. and the one I guess in Healdsburg is is sold out now, if I'm not mistaken, or close it's, to it. It's close. So we <clears throat> with this group called Kendall, who are Quaker based. So it's because our um, values are so aligned that they could imagine doing this mm -hmm. kind of strange thing, Zen inspired senior living. And we, of course, felt comfortable. I, I always say it's nice to have a partner, you know, won't lie to you. Mm -hmm. so they're, they're phenomenal that way. And, you know, in my previous, previous life, I was a film producer. So making something like this is just, it's the same process. It's just bigger. You, you still have to get all the pieces together with people who are really good at what they do. And my job is to hold the vision through the whole process. So in, in Healdsburg, it's 221 independent units and 30 memory care, 24 memory care and 30 assisted living all in one space. And in the one we're just starting in Southern California, it's a little bit bigger, 237 independent units. Mm -hmm. So so, but a project that size is like a quarter billion dollar project or something like that. It's, it's more than that. Million in Healdsburg and probably four hundred million in Southern California. Oh my gosh, <laughs> this is you've moved up in the world from oh, from no, from, from Tassahara, which is like you know, <laughs> uh, I've hung I've hung out in Tassahara. It's, it's very it's very wonderful. very meager. There are funding mechanisms because of what we are. The it's. Yeah. Um, tax exempt bond participation. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing with a very sophisticated market. And we sold out so quickly in Enso Village that people were, we got everyone's attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to be an idea that people are into. Mm -hmm. Roshi Joan, talk about your perspective on community and Sangha and, 
And I, some people live at Upaya, I, I, and, and if I'm not mistaken, I don't know how large that community is. And I, I know during COVID, you were particularly careful about uh, keeping it um, keeping it safe there. Um, so could you maybe talk a little bit about um, what you've created uh, in Santa Fe, or you and others have helped to create? <laughs> You know, I look at San Francisco Zen Center as the kind of Queen Mary of Zen in America. It's such an awesome institution. And we have a very interesting connection um, with San Francisco Zen Center. We're not exactly in the sort of same lineage per se. It's a Suzuki Roshi lineage and through Glassman Roshi and Maizumi Roshi, we're in a, you know, kind of a, a sister line or a brother line. Mm -hmm. And um, our vision and mission was quite different than San Francisco Zen Centers. In other words, Upaya was founded as a context where uh, training in social service and social action could happen, um, particularly uh, training that was based in a contemplative view. And that's what we've done for decades. We've trained probably thousands now of clinicians, of doctors, nurses, and other clinicians from all over the world. Um, we have a, a very powerful uh, chaplaincy training program with people from all over the world. But um, where San Francisco Zen Center is like the Queen Mary, we're like a sloop. <laughs> uh, you know, to make a decision, I think at San Francisco Zen Center, uh, it takes a long while. <laughs> Whereas uh, for us to make a decision, it's very emergent. Um, we're, you know, uh, we respond rather uh, quickly and spontaneously to whatever is, you know, before us. Like, uh, for example, uh, when COVID hit, because we have uh, young people in our community, uh, we went online in one day. Wow. It was that was really stunning, and um, uh, our online or the Mahasanga work. You know, thousands of people suddenly came into our network who were, uh, you know, just in in lockdown. Um, uh, many of whom uh, uh, were actually uh, very uh, grief stricken or lonely and had no place where they could go to practice. So, as I said, our sloop-like nature <laughs> is very different from uh, the uh, uh, scope of what San Francisco Zen Center uh, does and operates out of. Mm -hmm. and I, I think that, you know, um, I actually I have to say the notion of scaling up, which is very um, popular in uh, uh, the, the, the world of corporations and uh, uh, certain NGOs um, is not my world. My world is about intimacy and depth. And so that's a little bit um, our frame of reference is not to scale up, but to go deep, uh, not to be so wide, mm. but to work at a much more uh, intimate scale. And that's, there are many Dharma doors. Um, mm -hmm. This is just one uh, Dharma door, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, though needless to say, our online presence uh, kind of took us by surprise. Um, and I think it was because uh, we were able to do this so quickly. Uh, we didn't even sit in one committee meeting <laughs> to make that decision. <clears throat> we already <laughs> had skills uh, because of the young people uh, in our community. Oops, I just see my, my uh, now my mic is plugged in. So in any case, it's a very different structure and frame of reference. But like San Francisco Zen Center and other Zen Centers, we have a continuity of practice. We have an intimate practice community uh, that is a group of residents who practice. And we also um, have a, a faculty that is... Um, uh, not so uh, within one lineage. Um, we're rather inclusive in our approach in terms of, you know, bringing in someone like, maybe you haven't heard of her, she's incredible, Heather McTeer-Tony, who is uh, 
uh, a black woman who was the first uh, black mayor of Greenville, Mississippi, and is mm. an extraordinary <clears throat> uh, environmentalist and was, you know, was uh, uh, part of the EPA under Barack Obama. So, you know, that if they're good, I want them to speak to um, not only our people, but I want them to, you know, have a, a platform that reaches mm. as deeply into the world as possible. Mm. One last question about community, and then we're going to go to talking about sacred space and ritual. Um, being in Santa Fe, is is, is there a, a certain just for those? There, ME, <clears throat> MEA has uh, the Modern Elder Academy has its initial presence was in Baja California, with a campus, and then uh, a residential community, a regenerative community called Baja Sage, with twenty six homes around a regenerative farm that opens this summer. Um, all with MEA alumni. And we're very excited to be moving to Santa Fe and having a campus open in the Galisteo Basin uh, and with a second campus in town uh, in the future, and then a res residential community. What is it that's different about Santa Fe? Uh, and was there a reason U U Upaya ended up in Santa Fe? Well, first of all, I, I've came to Santa Fe in 1972, I had a National Science Foundation Fellowship in Visual Anthropology. And I, it, the minute I landed there, I went, my bioregion. <laughs> I felt so at home at altitude. But also another aspect was very important to me. And that was um, that there was diversity in the community. The mm -hmm. fact that uh, indigenous peoples lived uh, in this landscape and have for thousands of years, the fact that the uh, language, the ritual process, the house styles, the ethos uh, of uh, both the Tewa speaking and uh, the Diné uh, communities um, were intact in spite of uh, the colonial uh, horrors that we're all now uh, becoming more aware of. The fact that the, there were these living, vibrant, uh, though distressed communities um, whose seed heritage had been preserved for uh, millennia, um, it was, I loved it. I mm. just felt like, thank you. And then the Hispanic population where, um, you know, I felt that connection, you know, for the, in relation to the small villages. And in fact, I'm in a, a high altitude valley at 9,400 feet, surrounded mm. by 3 million acres of national forest, completely off grid, no plumbing, nothing, um, but in, in, a, in my hermitage. And um, my closest neighbors, of course, um, have been you know, here for generations. There's there people uh, actually down valley, down the watershed for me in El Valle, a very little known village. Uh, I'm about 10 miles over a terrifying road from uh, Truchas. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, to live uh, in these uh, in relation to these communities and to practice with indigenous peoples as friends and as collaborators in terms of, for example, the rematriation of indigenous seeds, which is part of what Upaya does, which is grow out corn seed for people in Santa Clara Pueblo and in and other indigenous tribes um, really is very congruent with my heart. Mm -hmm. And I love everything from the high mountains here when I'm looking up at uh, a, a, a place called Hikaria Peak, which is at about 12,000 feet that even at the age of 80, I'm still hiking up there. And uh, I also love the deserts, particularly going to Chaco Canyon, where mm -hmm. the archaeology points to the relationship between the great skies of New Mexico and the earth. Mm -hmm. Wow, you have me here in San Francisco wishing I was there in New Mexico right now. <laughs> well, you will be. I will be. Shortly. Yes, I and will. Don't just stay in your nice ranch. You really um, to uh, go out into this fantastic uh, world that where there's so much cultural richness. Yes. And there's also conflict. And that is to say yeah. that, uh, you know, Los Alamos National Laboratory, for those of us who are pacifists, you know, presents us with a 
ethical equation that is important for us to actually consider, even though we're old, mm -hmm. what are the downstream effects from what's happening at Los Alamos, uh, you know, mm -hmm. just on the other side of the Rio Grande River. Yeah. And my Pueblo neighbors um, joined me in that concern. Mm. Wow, thank you very much for giving us that evocative feeling of the land of enchantment. Um, Susan, let's go, go back to you and talk about sacred space and ritual. Um, uh, one of the things that we've seen at MEA is that uh, when people come to a workshop or they are living in community, uh, they deeply appreciate ritual, um, what you might call routine in the normal world. But when it has a, a certain flavor to it, it's not routine, it's ritual. Do you want to talk a little bit about that in the context of the, of the Zen Center community in terms of creating sacred space for ritual? Yeah, thank you. Well, the Zen centers are set up for um, coming together, being in the same space, whether it's the meditation hall or the, you know, the place where we do service or we eat. So um, the rituals around the timing of those things, they have, they have shape. This is when you go here and this is when you go there. So that you're talking about routine. I, you know, when we do our um, description before a long meditation retreat of the rules of the retreat, the first one is follow the schedule completely. <laughs> and the last one is follow the schedule completely. So there's a, there's a shape that you can, you can um, be supported by. Mm -hmm. Um so there's the, that kind of routine shape. Um, and then what we're doing at Enso Village and at Enso Verde is we're putting a meditation hall in the center of the community, which is, it hasn't been really done in this way before. There are chapels in many communities, but maybe they're off to the side or they're not the focus point. So placing a place of ritual and meditation in the center is uh, an indication of what the heart of the community actually is, which mm -hmm. is coming together and often in silence to to um, yeah deepen deepen our appreciation for being alive. I mm -hmm. think that's uh, that's what the silence does um, with no with less distractions. Um, and how do you how do you sacral sacralize a space? Um, I don't know if that's the right word, but I. I ask that partly because one of our campuses in in uh, Santa Fe is a former Catholic retreat center and seminary on Museum Hill, which includes a chapel that mm -hmm. has be, been de desacralized. Uh, I don't know if that's the right word, but um, and at some point in the future, we're going to turn it into a you know a book a, a, a great library with a hundred thousand books in it. But it's I want to, I'd love to understand, like, is there a way to actually create, in, especially when you're creating a new space, is it just the ongoing use of that space in the way you're ritualizing it that creates the, say, the feeling of it being a sacred space? Or is there some, are there actually steps you take? There's a ritual to ritualize it. So <laughs> one of the things that we're really good at in Zen is doing ceremonies. And it's different than other meditation. Well, some, you know, Tibetan meditation has ceremonies too, but we're, we're really into, you know, a very simple ceremony that draws the attention and the focus to what's going on and, and sort of pulls your heart out and gets you engaged on that level. So there is, there will be a, a moment when we open the meditation hall with a ritual and there's a way of opening the eyes of the of the Buddha that's on the altar, and you use a calligraphy brush, and and it's you know there's a lot of history, uh, esoteric history about certain ways you hold your body, which actually conveys to the rest of you that this is special. So it's yogic and it's tradition, and it's in our case simple, mm. uh, and involves of course the whole community buying into making this a sacred space. So. Hmm. Joan, do you have any thoughts about how to create sacred spaces and how to how important they are within a community, a physical community? Yeah, I think that the, the ritual process is so important um, for 
the experience of community. It's like the glue, if you will. You know, it really allows one to take nothing for granted. Mm -hmm. And even the word ritual um, is uh, sourced in the same word for right. It's, it's a process mm -hmm. by which mm -hmm. we set things right. Mm -hmm. And of course, part of the ritual process is, you know, the ceremony itself. And it's interesting to look at the root of the word ceremony. It shares uh, meaning with the word cure. So, you know, wow. what, what allows us to, um, in, you know, be uh, in relation to each other in a way that um, acknowledges the, this experience of sacredness, um, uh, discovering sacredness, not only in the sort of transcendent sense, but also in terms of our everyday life of our everyday relationships or our everyday activities. So like eating, uh, what Susan was saying, you know, um, we actually not, it's not like an uh, overwhelming ritualistic uh, fuzzy wuzzy or whatever <laughs> experience, but it's acknowledging um, where this food comes from mm. and what this food means. 72 labors brought us this food. We should know how it comes to us. Mm -hmm. so this is what we say in our formal uh, Zen uh, eating ritual. And, you know, I want to just say that um, ritual also marks in significant phase shifts in people's lives. So, you know, in working with dying people, needless to say, where the experience of aging and dying, it's a profoundly important developmental phase for us as human beings. But what happens often, for example, in the hospital setting or in nursing homes, that that phase shift from life and into death is not marked by ritual. Mm -hmm. And that has an actual mm -hmm. adverse effect on those who witness um, the dying process. So in a way, the ritual process allows us to um, express gratitude and to descale, if you will, uh, the small self. Um, and I, I look on it in a way as, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the work of Francisco Varela, it is a process of participatory sense-making. We come together in the experience of ritual to make sense of our world, our lives, our relationship to each other. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, the sectarianizing, no, I would say the, um, uh, the movement away from uh, rituals of significance in our society, I feel um, has caused a, a lot of harm and um, uh, has also uh, had a, an adverse effect on uh, how communities operate as uh, living beings. And so um, I'm, you know, when you walk into a Timenos, like the chapel of the place that you uh, are, are uh, going to be creating, um, you know, in, in uh, not so far from Upaya, or, or you walk yeah. into uh, uh, Green Gulch's beautiful Zendo or Upaya's beautiful Zendo, you know, you feel something um, that is uh, intangible, but that brings you uh, into this sense of meaning and of awe. Mm. And so I, I'm sure you will resacralize that space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And you just said the word I was going to take us to in, in our third course and in, in this three course meal with dessert, fourth course being our, our community asking questions. So if people have questions, this is the time to actually go down to the reactions button at the bottom and look at and click on that and you'll see raise hand and you can raise your hand. And do not wait till the last five minutes of our conversation, which is an hour conversation, to do that because you'll be disappointed. I will not come to you. This is the time to do it or do it in the next few minutes. But I'm going to go back to the word awe that Roshi Joan just used. Um, 
Dacker Keltner, Dr. Dacker Keltner is a good friend of MEA. He lives part-time uh, within walking distance of the MEA campus in Baja. Yep, he's a UC Berkeley professor, great, started the Greater Good Science Center. He teaches at MEA once a year, every December. And for those who want to, to know that, he'll be teaching in December in Baja. He wrote a book that came out in January about awe. And he said there are the eight pathways of awe. And he studied across 26 countries how we find awe as in everyday life experiences as humans. And one of his big surprises was that it, across cultures, nature, which is of course what almost all of us would have said, oh, the best place to find awe is in nature. That actually came in third place as if there's a, this is like the Miss America, the Miss Awe pageant, um, you know, but in terms of what were the commonalities, it was the third most likely cited. Number one and number two were very human experiences. Number one was moral beauty, seeing courage and kindness in everyday actions. And number two was collective effervescence. One of my favorite phrases of all time from Emile Durkheim, the French sociologist, which is to see that in certain kinds of environments, people's sense of ego separation starts to dissolve and their sense of communal joy emerges. I wanna ask the both of you, and maybe Roshi John, let's start with you this time, about your experience with awe in community and in the Zen tradition. and and, and feel free to riff around moral beauty or collective effervescence or anything. But I feel like awe is a quality in our society that somehow we we attach to Super Bowl Sunday. Um, <laughs> um, and there are so many opportunities. Uh, and for those who don't know what that reference is, that's the NFL football. You know, it's, um, <laughs> but I feel like there's so many opportunities for us to experience awe in microwaves throughout the day, and it actually is sustenance for us. Um, so Joan, any thoughts on that? You know, uh, the chapter that really moved me in Dacker's book on awe was on moral beauty. Mm. And um, why it moved me is why I think there's great potential in Enso Village and why I love Upaya. And that is um, when a community or individuals within the community decide to actually do good for others, um, there can be a kind of breakthrough, a sort of uh, opening that um, uh, lets awe flow. And it's not about creating, you know, some big ma uh, mega project. It's really in the small gestures, um, and this is, uh, Dacker gave a few very poignant examples um, where uh, all just broke open, you know, the guy who put these loving messages in the handle of the broom, the prisoner, um, and uh, so forth. So one of the things that I wanted just to bring up while we have time uh, in this conversation is how important it is in places like MEA or uh, the Enso villages that there be uh, opportunities for people to actually engage in social service, in mm -hmm. service to others, in projects. I know one of the things that brings awe to our community is that we several times a week cook for the unsheltered. And that it just fills people up um, when they're doing it uh, and, and so forth. So I, I just, you know, awe comes, I mean, yes, a great sunset uh, and so forth, but uh, it often comes from uh, moments where humility and humbleness are present. Mm. Beautiful. Susan. I appreciate that, Joan. We're, we're gonna have a, a work circle in the morning for people who are going out to volunteer. So, um, I'm very interested in that too. Uh, I, I wanted to go back to ritual for a second because I think another aspect that supports awe is the realization that we're all in this together. So the sense of connection of community. So, and Joan is familiar with this ritual that came out of hospice work where a person dies and their body in, in the case of Enzo Village will be brought down into the main courtyard on the gurney and and circumambulate, we have a memorial grove just for mm -hmm. this purpose. 
and, and flower petals are strewn as the body is leaving. And to me, the most important part of that process is those flower petals remaining on the ground for I don't know how long. Because if you're away and someone in your community, there's a shift in the community by someone dying, you need to be able to see it. You need, mm. If you weren't there for the body leaving, those rose petals alone or the flower petals on the ground, to me, I, I can see it already and feel it already, but the sense of mm. the connection between people being underlined with that kind of a, a moment of awareness and ritual. So, um, yeah, that's what I think. Of that. Mm, beautiful. Well, let's go to some questions here from our community. Um, we have Fern up first. Fern is on Ohlone, Ohlone land, which means that I get would guess that she's on the West Coast on uh, maybe a, around, I don't know, Santa Cruz or somewhere like that. Where, where are you, Fern? I'm in Mountain View, a little bit south okay. of San Francisco. You got it. What's your question for us? So thank you, Susan, and thank you, Roshi, for being Oops. here. I wanted to talk a bit about um, conflict and community because that's bound to happen, especially since we're being more inclusive and not everyone has taken precepts. So um, I'd like you to address this. I know a lot of communities are starting ethical and conduct guidelines, but I would love to hear your approach to this. Thank you. Well, I, I just want to, I understand about conflict. I've lived in the community for a long time. And, and there are mediators who have had to help us. Um, Zen, Zen teachers aren't any better necessarily at conflict than anyone else. Um, and there are guidelines that we try to follow, uh, multicultural guidelines. But what we're going to be doing at Enso Village in Verde is we are offering a training that comes out of the hospice movement uh, that's about not just dying, but aging together. And that training involves, you know, mindfulness and self-care and boundaries, et cetera. And we're training the entire staff and making it available to residents so that there's a common vocabulary or a common kind of sense of how to work with, um, you know, burnout and, and difficulties, right? And I'm hoping that that will help the potential conflicts between you know staff and residents, but maybe just it'll help everybody. That's that's what I hope. Yeah. That's great. No, I think that's great. You know, um, I think one of the most important things is to understand that discord is part of the experience of being in community, and having the the skillful means to actually work with discord in a way that is non-polarizing, um, I think is uh, essential for the health of the community, where there's a deep emphasis on transparency um, uh, and on taking responsibility, where you know the recitation of the precepts in, classically in, in Buddhist communities, um, but not so much in Zen. We do it on full moon, but we don't confess our misdeeds. <laughs> we, we refer to them distally. And I think that uh, one of the ways of working with this is in you know, a council process, a process of really sharing uh, and uh, where we have gone off the rails um, uh, in, in a way that is uh, public and also um, non-self-blaming, but making uh, the vow to correct course uh, in the future. But again, you know, being in community means that we share a common reservoir of values and also a common reservoir of love. Mm. So uh, before we go to the, the, our next question from the community village folks, how, Joan, how do you do that? I love your social activism and your, your idealism. And one of the questions I've always at, uh, considered about communes and any kind of community. We, uh, let me just stop you for a minute. Yeah. I am not an idealist. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, no, okay. sorry. 
I'm sorry. I, 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 that's the farthest thing from what I am in a certain okay. way. Okay. I, but continue. I, I, so I, I, my language is wrong, but I, I think with very, um, I think you've, you know, you're very focused on values, if 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 that's accurate, um, and and the and the aspiration of what those how they can be practically lived in the real world. Um, I I wonder when you have communities, how do you make sure that you have the not like minded people who then are like colored people? They're all the same color, but they're like hearted people, and and there's a way that you're looking for culture ads, not culture fits. Any thoughts on that, Susan or uh, Joan, in terms of the process of creating an environment where you bring people together who come from very different backgrounds, um, even when it's not maybe a natural fit, um, you almost have to to encourage it. Susan, do you have thoughts on that? We were talking about this a little bit before we started about how how do we work with people coming in on staff and et cetera. And, and I always say the one requirement for either being on staff or living in this community is to not be allergic to meditation mm -hmm. because it's going to be happening. So if that is not okay with you for whatever reason, it's fine. But other than that, there's going to be a huge variety of personalities and backgrounds. And, you know, there are limits, financial limits, and we have some areas where we've lowered the pricing to try to work with that. But, you know, our healthcare system is broken. And this is the best we can do right now is to come up with a way to balance taking care of some teachers and other people um, coming into the community. So financially, mm -hmm. it's is the most difficult, I would yeah. say. Okay. Um, but other than that, you know, like if you're not allergic to that, then come mm -hmm. on in. Got it. Thank you. Joan, any thoughts on that in terms of diversity? Yes. I think from the point of view of uh, the ecological perspective in terms of uh, diversity, we know that requisite diversity makes for healthier systems. And so um, that as a kind of principle, operating principle, I think is essential as um, communities are being built. And just to say, one of the most uh, astonishing uh, relationships uh, I have had uh, with a student um, was, uh, has been with uh, a man who worked inside uh, the Trump administration and before that was in the mm -hmm. Bush administration and worked in the Pentagon. Then, you know, Obama won and then he went over to the Hudson Institute and then he became, you know, a very powerful presence in the Trump administration, my student. And um, he became my student because his wife died of cancer and uh, he wanted to, mm -hmm. you know, kind of give a new frame to his life. And I will honestly say that um, our relationship was strengthened by our differences. Mm -hmm. And I think we were kind of a role model <laughs> of how you can love um, through the differences. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it too often, you know, it's we're, we're going for uh, harmony at the cost of health. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, as an anthropologist um, and someone who studied ecological theory, particularly the work of Margalef, I know that requisite diversity is what makes communities healthy. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that answer. Let's go to the community village. <laughs> Hi, guys. Tell it, give us your names. Uh, and, wh and which community village are you? <laughs> Many. <laughs> I'm Nina. Good to meet you all. <laughs> and I'm Caleb. Um, yeah, thanks all for, for being here, for doing where, this. Where are you calling from? Uh, we're calling from San Francisco at the moment. Okay, okay great. And what's your, um, what's your question? Yeah, so we started a um, cross-lineage meditation community called Community Village, uh, oriented towards people in their 20s and 30s. And it's all about bringing practice into everyday life and doing that in community through small, like, peer-led pods, practice discussion, social activities, things like that. Um, and our question is that, you know, we see a lot of young people 
have a real disconnect between uh, the practice and then life. Um, and we wonder in the absence of living physically in community with each other, you know, we're decentralized building communities in, in different places. Um, how can we best create communities that support this ability to integrate these values that we care about into our everyday life? Embody it. I mean, if you're the leadership or if, even if it's decentralized and you're taking certain responsibilities for this community, people are going to look to you. And so what's your practice? How do you how do you stay ethical in a meeting where you're having to make a financial decision, right? Just what what is your practice and what are your difficulties? And then get some mentorship on people who've been doing this a long time. But of course, mm -hmm. you need to be able to communicate it in your own language mm -hmm. to your generation. Beautiful. Joan? I have really nothing to add. I feel mm -hmm. this is so aligned with what Susan has just shared. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the great work you're doing in the world. Um, Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you both. So, yes, I'm unmuted. Great. So I was really interested in what you were saying, Roshi, about requisite diversity, because I've been thinking about that, Susan, in relation to ENSO. And so it's really interest, intriguing to me what provides the requisite diversity in the Upaya community, and what do you see providing that, Susan, in ENSO? Because because of the finances of aging and healthcare in our country, it doesn't look to me like we have a whole lot of diversity in the sense that this country describes as diversity. We, we have all different kinds of people, but not so much cultural diversity. And of course, we don't have age diversity. So that's a whole other issue is what lets us be porous enough. Perhaps there aren't people in the community that bring that diversity, perhaps in our interactions with the community around, we get it. So I'm very interested in what each of you has to say on that. Well, you just said it, Porous, porousness. So weakening the inside outside structure um, and um, finding out what the commonalities are amongst the differences. Um, actively engaging in the wider community, finding ways for to be open to the community to come in. Those are the, some of the things that I've been thinking about. Wonderful. Well, Catherine, as you were just at Upaya, uh, I'm sure you saw some interesting variabilities, including having uh, a Theravad monk in an orange robe um, uh, who, uh, only could eat till noon, um, but always uh, joined together with us. And also uh, him being both Mexican and young. And uh, so that was, you know, it, not everybody dressed in black, if you will. And um, I, I think it's important, you know, you have to be proactive about, um, you know, the seeds that you plant, so to speak, uh, and, you know, make a garden that um, has that diversity, it takes intentionality. And it also takes some education and, uh, uh, you know, on the part of the, the uh, community um, to uh, come to really appreciate the differences instead of having the experience of uh, threat arise. So it, I, I, you know, I loved having Bhante in our midst. Um, uh, Bipul, who was uh, uh, from India and from a, a you know a lay Theravadan uh, community, it was wonderful having Bipul in our midst. I think you were there when he was there, and I think this is the the point. You know, it's like um, uh, how we cleaned the temple toilets together, which is very <laughs> interesting because yes. somebody from his traditions in India doesn't clean toilets. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate it. People, it's wonderful. 
Mm -hmm. um, we appreciated him not resisting our structures and Bonte mm -hmm. didn't re resist our structures, but we also hug at mm -hmm. Upaya. And mm -hmm. needless to say, Bonte, you know, doesn't hug. Mm -hmm. So uh, the way he handled it was wonderful or doing mm -hmm. Khan Roman when, you know, at a certain point in the liturgy, everybody's dancing around madly. And he's he's there, you know, holding his gasho up in stillness. Mm -hmm. It's all good. And I, I, you know, I could be his great grandmother. I always wanted to hug him, but I knew, you know, that that's a that's not respectful. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. respecting our differences. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. I wanted to add one of the things we're going to do at Enso Verde is the 20 units that will be available for meditation teachers. Um, we're going to add not just Buddhist meditation, but a couple of rabbis and a couple of yoga teachers and hopefully a Native American person so that that spiritual community, what they'll have in common is meditation mm -hmm. just from their various. So that's going to be an experiment, but that's we're able to do that down there because we have different obligations. So, Griffin, you have. 10 seconds to ask, ask your question. <laughs> Oops, Hi, I'm Griffin. I practice at City Center in San Francisco, and I live in um, New Haven right now, waiting to get to Enso. And I was just reflecting on perhaps the serendipity or the luck that brought Enso to me, that brought Susan to me, um, and that the diversity comes from listening to each other. Um, I didn't know. I was in another practice for 50 years. I meditated in a different tradition and was slowly getting heartbroken. And I came to San Francisco Zen Center empty-handed and open-hearted. And the refuge it offered me um, with the routines and the services and the sangha and the, gave me freedom um, to express my diversity. Mm -hmm. I now share freely that I am genderqueer. Um, there's a, um, the, I don't know, I'm, I'm just so grateful about, you know, there's, there's the direction of my practice and my effort. And then there is this richness that came from Susan, from the, you know, the enthusiasm of practice. I just saw her at one of the first ENSO meetings without knowing who she was. And I came up to her and I said, I want to spend my last few years in silence. And she said, I do too. <laughs> you no, know, and it was like, oh, wow. You know, people from my planet. Um, and I, it's very, very wonderful and exciting. And I just feel so lucky that, mm -hmm. um, I came to this after being, you know, really so empty in the wrong way. Thank Griffin, you. Griffin, thank you very much. Right. Thank you. What a what a beautiful way for us to end. Um, and a, a um, enlightened endorsement. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you very much, Griffin. Uh, Susan and Joan, um, it is an honor to be sharing an hour with you here and for you to do the great work that you're doing in the world and for all three organizations, San Francisco Zen Center, including Enzo Village and Enzo Verde, Upaya, as well as MEA, um, we, we are trying to build a community at a time where we desperately need it. That's for sure. So um, thanks to everybody. Thank you to Carrie and, and the team who have actually helped to do all of the back end work to make this come together today. Um, for those of you who are interested in MEA and want to learn more about MEA, I think you've seen it in the chat. There's some, been some information or go to just modernelderacademy.com. And um, thank you. <laughs>